Hey, welcome to the Making of an Exception podcast. Today, we've got Ben Hoare with us. What's up, Ben? Let's go. How you doing? Let's go. <laughs> I'm doing great. Hey, thanks for being on the podcast today. Yeah, thanks for having me. You're welcome. Uh, ben Hoare, uh, if you didn't know, you're listening. He is one of my best friends. What a great guy. Uh, but he is now, uh, at this moment in time, he's now the Minneapolis campus pastor at River Valley Church. And uh, it's just an amazing season in our, the church that we're a part of and uh, the community of people even in, in that city. And you're stepping into that brand new role. How do you feel so far? I feel great. Um, when I first found out, my head was spinning for a while, um, but... And I would be talking to people and I would say, I feel two things. I feel super underqualified being 26 years old, being in ministry for less than two years. Yeah. But I really feel like God's in this. And me and my wife, Emma, felt that way from the beginning. Um, and I was talking to a couple of people and a couple of mentors of mine. And they were just like, you don't have to, don't say that again. Don't say you're underqualified because the moment God calls you, that's all the qualification you need. And so that's what yeah. I'm leaning on is just God calling my name for some reason, yeah. seeing something in me. And so it's just an honor to be able to pastor the Minneapolis campus and just to be able to yeah, see more people in that city come to know Jesus and just yeah. the hope and the salvation and the joy that comes from that relationship. And my heart breaks truly for, for this city. And so I don't feel like I like am well equipped and I don't feel like I have it all together and I want to be a leader that's vulnerable in that. Um, yeah. but I'm just trying to, yeah, give it everything I have yeah, and just and you'll see do what it. happens. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, you preached this weekend, uh, this past weekend, just when we're filming this and, uh, I got a bunch of texts just like, yo, He's got it, dude. He's got it. So you, I guess you let it rip this weekend, which I'll is let great. It go. Yeah. And, and I think that's what people want, want to see, you know? It's like, I, th I think people don't want to see polished anymore. Yeah. They just want to see passion. Yeah. And it's like, you know, I like, you know, something. I mean, come prepared, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, for <laughs> sure. <laughs> don't just talk nonsense come, yeah, up there. Come prayed up. Yeah. Come prayed up. But like, I think that passion that comes from your relationship with Jesus, like if that is the thing that's the most evident, yeah. in a sermon or in a message or even in just a one-on-one -on -one conversation. It's like things that I'm not even interested in. If I see somebody that's passionate about it, I'm like, I'm interested in this now Yeah, because they're just passionate. And so it's like, why, why are Christians not passionate about Jesus Christ? You know, yeah. not only do we have abundant life now, but we have eternal life. Yeah. And it's like, I think people out of anything just want to see leaders and pastors that are passionate yeah, no for doubt. Jesus. And so for me, that's, I'm, yeah let it rip, be prepared, but just let that passion flow. Yeah, it's great. Uh, we're going to talk more about just the transition in this season where you're at. Um, you're married. Yes. You've been married for almost, almost two, two years. years. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Uh, what's her name? Emma. <laughs> Emma. <laughs> like I don't know her. <laughs> Coolest person around. Emma yeah. Whore. She, and you she's... know, she loves me just because she married me. Yes. And she, her last name is now Whore. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You're right. There's a, there's a challenge. God. Yeah. There's Praise a God. challenge there, but she loves you. She's going to spend the rest of your life yeah. or her life with you. Uh, she's a teacher. <laughs> yep. Um, and, uh, we can talk a little bit of like how you guys met and all that, but I'd also like to talk about your upbringing and a lot of how you, how did you, and that's what this podcast is, the making yeah. of an exception. I do believe there's something special on your life. The hand of God is on your life. Uh, just uniquely, and you are an exception to the rule, meaning that there's I, like your story and how you got to where you are now, and this isn't the end of your life. This isn't the pinnacle of your life. It's not all downhill from here, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully not. Good luck. Uh, but, but how you got to where you're at now is is crazy. Like yeah. it's a crazy journey and you're one of the most fun dudes, uh, most energetic dudes, most positive guys, uh, but you carry you carry a weight to you as well. And, but that yeah. weight um, has developed quickly over time. Uh, just even when, when we met, you coming to River Valley and your journey of interning to part-time staff to full-time staff to now leading the campus, uh, there, there's just been, it's been quick weight that's been yeah. added to you, like the words that you say, the things that you do, um, the influence that you've gained. It's, it's been like just the time frame of who you were to who you are now has been so quick. I love that that's what God can do. Some, sometimes the journeys, it's a long journey mm -hmm. of that. 
And sometimes God does it in a power packed season, you know, and I feel like that's been your journey. So I'd love to talk about just how you got to where you're at now, starting with uh, back to the beginning. I mean, it doesn't have to be your birth story, but it can just be, yeah, the family that you were raised in. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Where'd you grow up? Yeah. I grew up in Ohio, grew up in Columbus, Ohio and OH. IO. Let's go. Come on. Big Buckeye fan, Kurt Graham. Listen, I don't know what a Buckeye (laughs) is. And I'm not a Buckeye fan, but uh, isn't it a nut, actually? It is. It's yeah. kind of lame. It's super lame. But everybody's pumped oh, about, like, like, if you're from Ohio, it's like... People know. Yeah, people know. Yeah. I've not, never actually met... A, we're not ashamed about it. Uh, isn't there Ohio University? There's Ohio University, which is the Bobcats, and then there's Ohio okay. State, the Ohio State University. Can I just tell you, I know countless people from Ohio. I've never met a Bobcat fan. <laughs> Yeah, no one likes that's, Ohio University. That's really tough. It's tough for the Bobcats. I guess. Okay, so, so you yeah, grew up I grew, in Ohio. I grew up in Ohio. Um, I have four brothers, which I love so much. Wow, five boys. Five boys. Any sisters? No, my mom actually wanted five daughters, and she got five sons, which is crazy. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I don't know why I threw that, that in there. Is a, that's, she wanted five children. She really wanted five children. Her heart was set on five growing up, and she thought for sure it was going to be five daughters, and God gave her five sons, which is insane. She never watched a baseball game in her life. And she's probably watched over a thousand baseball games after the five of us. I mean, she's an expert player. She's an expert now. So yeah, grew up in Ohio. One of my first memories actually is giving my life to Jesus. I know that sounds so epic. (laughs) Wow. And I don't really know the last time I told somebody that. I've actually never heard that. Yeah. Yeah, it was, I was six years old and I was at this Bible man, like conference, or I don't even know what it is. I don't know if he was doing conferences or... (laughs) Who knows? Yeah. And I just remember sitting, it was actually the same college I ended up going to in my hometown, sitting in pews. And I just remember something in my heart that was stirring and just like, I need to, I, I want to accept Jesus as my savior and walking towards. And that's like one of my first memories, at five or six years old. Yeah. And so I, following Jesus, my faith has been a part of my journey for you guys almost grew, my entire you grew life. Up going, going to church? Yeah, grew up going to church, grew up going to more of a conservative church, went yeah. to a Lutheran church for the first probably six to 10 years of my life. And then yeah. we went to a Nazarene church and then a Baptist church. Mm. Um, and so definitely more conservative than what I'm a part of now. Yeah. And it was just yeah a little bit different of, of a background, but my, my family, my parents grew up Christians. You know, they taught us, we went through Bible studies. We did different devotionals. Um, yeah. And I remember my mom waking me up every single morning and be by my bedside and be praying for me. No and way. every night she would be praying for me. And I think that you'd wake up and she was on yeah, her knees she would by be your just bed. like, wake me up. What like, about the other boys? Uh, they, well, they maybe, maybe, not, maybe, maybe, maybe not. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. I don't <laughs> know. So my mom, yeah, my dad would throw water on me when he tried to wake me up. My no. mom would just like lightly just like rub my back. And just like pray over me. And so my mom would flip the light switch on. She would say, uh, get up, get up in the morning. It's time to rise and shine. And my, my irises would be burned out of my eyes. I don't know what it is about moms and singing songs in the morning. My mom would sing, good morning, good morning. It's time to wake up. Oh, wow. Haunts me to this day. That stinking song. (laughs) This is great. But she was amazing. So yeah, grew up in the church. Um, but I grew up in a family that I would say, um, with having four brothers, when we had difficulties or when we had problems, it was easy for us to bury them. Mm. And those are things that I'm still honestly working through today that I finally have become aware of them just in the last year or two, yeah. just through my relationship with God and just different people in my life. You, my relationship with you and different pastors is like, there's certain things in my life that have been buried for years. Mm. Like we, my, what was instilled in me as a kid was you work hard. Yeah. You work hard, you work harder than everybody else, whatever you're passionate about, you just give it everything you have. And I yeah. think that's so important. Yeah. And I think like, like I'm so blessed to have parents that like instilled that in me. Um, but within that, it's like when you made a mistake along the way, it was like, you just kind of bury it, Yeah. you know? And I'm even like, I'm thinking about different pressures. I that's think that's not, that's not what you were told to do. That's just, how that's just you like the, yeah, that's just kind of like maybe is less of the parenting and more just how I thought it was yeah. or just me and myself. It was pro- probably yeah. less of the environment around me and more just 
maybe my perfectionist in me yeah. and just trying to, yeah, just trying not to let you know that I'm making a mistake. Mm. And I think that's what God has led me through so much and is being vulnerable and being real and what that truly means. I know vulnerability and being real is a, a word that's thrown out a lot. Yeah, and yeah. Wh- but what does that really mean to me? And so like for me, like now God is showing me like, hey, there's pressures that you're called to carry yeah. and there's pressures that you shouldn't carry. Yeah. And those pressures that you shouldn't carry, figure out a way to let them go. Mm. The smallest things, no joke. Like I'm realizing this about myself and my upbringing when I'm with my wife and it's like, she's the most loving, the most gracious, incredible woman in the world. But for some reason, when I make a mistake, it's hard for me to admit it. Like I just bury it for literally six months. Do you, do you, just quick question. Do you think it has to do with you or is it there a fear of like what Emma would think about you? Um, like the dynamic of admitting that you've done something wrong or that you failed or that you made a mistake. Is it something inside of you or is it just the th- thought like what would Emma, th- what would Emma, th- I don't want to let her down. Yeah. I think it's more so what's within me. Yeah. Like I, because there's been times where I've admitted the mistake and it's like, grace right away. Yeah. And it's like, but yeah, what is it in me that thinks that I can't tell her, you know? So for six months I had four parking tickets in the front pocket of my book bag. Yeah. I could have paid them and it would have taken three minutes. Yeah. And every day I thought about it. It's not like I don't think about it. It's not like some people, they like make a mistake and they just don't remember it. Like I, every day I thought, there's four parking tickets in my front pocket. Yep. I'm not paying it today because I'm going to yeah. bury it. And for six months, it was added up and that just caused more anxiety. So I think when you you take the pressures and you keep them, the ones that you should let go, I think the one result that happens is greater anxiety. Yeah. And so for me, it's like, those are things in the upbringing. It's less, my parenting, I think is more so just like four guys, you know, less into our emotions than, yeah. than, you know, maybe four women would be, I don't know. But like, and so for me, it was, yeah, I had an amazing, amazing childhood. My parents that loved me so much, the parents that taught me the word of God, four brothers that were my best friends growing yeah. up. I honestly didn't have close friends. Like I had a few close friends, but not a ton because the people I wanted to hang out with were my brothers. Yeah. It was like everybody else was hanging out with people on Friday and Saturday. And I'm like, I just want to be with my, my brothers Yeah. and being in Minnesota. That's one of my, the hardest things being in Minnesota is no family members are here. Yeah. Um, and so I love my childhood and everything. I know you probably had a negative light talking about me burying things, but I think it was less just for some reason, what was within me and what God has shown me how I can lead myself better yeah. so that I can be more like. I can talk more about this when one day God blesses me with children to raise yeah. and, and walk through different pressures and what that looks like. Yeah. What did your parents do uh, for a living as you were growing up? Your dad's a businessman. I know that. Yeah. So my, my mom is a speech therapist, uh, but she was a stay at home mom for probably half of my life. So probably mm-hmm. until I was about 10 to 12, she was at home. Yep. She went back, back to work at an elementary 10 to 12, school. So for two years she was at home, you're saying? No, no, no. When I was like, I can't remember when exactly, but when I was like 10 or 12 years old, like that's in that timeline, that's when she went back. Got it, got it, got it. And then my dad is a pharmacist. Yep. And which is crazy um, that, nobody, yeah, that nobody uh, took over that family business. Everyone thought that, that one of the brothers were going to take over, but nobody did. Um, but yeah, he was a pharmacist and then went into owning three pharmacies, hometown pharmacies, where I grew up in Mount Vernon, Ohio. And so not only was he just a pharmacist, but he was a CEO of these small town uh, pharmacies, which is crazy. What was it like growing up uh, with, uh, you know, got saved at six, growing up in the church, uh, you know, and and also I guess you could speak to what is God speaking to you as a boy and in middle school and high school, but having a businessman dad, uh, successful, uh, you got, you got older brothers, you got a couple younger brothers, like, yeah. uh, well, yeah. What's it like, especially knowing where you're at now in ministry, Yeah. but you, you grew up in a business home. Yeah. I think the world and, and the family, the pressure would be like to follow my dad's footsteps. And you know, it's like, you have those job fairs in like high school. And it's like, every time I went to a job fair or different things, I was like, I want to be a pharmacist. Mm-hmm. because I felt like that was like the pressure or, or what I thought the family wanted and what I thought 
you know, the world, what it makes sense. You go into pharmacy, yeah. like, and all my other brothers are in business. So it's either you, you start a business or you're a part of business or you start and you know, be a part of a, a pharmacy, whatever it is. So for me, I think I just knew, like, I didn't think it was going to be ministry. Yeah. But I just knew, like, God had a different path for me. Yeah. And it was something I felt for a while. And really growing up, it's crazy, like, different leaders and different pastors in my life would speak into me saying like, you have a, you have a call on your life. And I didn't know what that meant. Like when I was 13 years old, like I could not even stand the thought of being in front of people and talking. Yeah. Like I was an introverted, like nervous kid. And I remember when I was 13 years old, are you still introverted? (sighs) No, I'm more of an extrovert now. Definitely. So it changed. Yeah, definitely. I don't know what changed, but do you definitely know when changed. It changed. Probably when I was in college. Something, when I was in college, I, I really felt like I stepped in who God called me to be, mm. and I and I felt like for a long time I was putting different pressures on myself to be somebody who I wasn't. In college, I felt like I walked into the security of who mm. God had created me to be, and be more of an extrovert. Um, but yeah, the thought of being in front of people like scared me to all end. And so, um, I remember when I was 13 years old, one of my youth pastors, he pointed to the stage and he said, you're going to be up there one day. You're going to be up there. And I'm like thinking, I like laughed, like there's not a shot. I'm going to be up there. Like I didn't even take it and receive the compliment. I just like moved on as quickly as I could. Yeah. So I'm like, there's no way. So I think like the world and my family would say, go into business. But I think there was just something in me where I knew God had something different. Yeah. I didn't think, again, I didn't think it was ministry. I just felt something different. Yeah, quickly, uh, talk about your parents' journey. Uh, your dad has now sold the business and kind of where they're at now uh, because we're about to get into your transition into ministry. But, uh, yeah, just the journey that your parents have been on the last couple of years, I think it's amazing. Yeah, it's been insane. Like, growing up, I would say we had, like, we, we talked about God, but, like, really a passion for Jesus wasn't there. Like it was more of a ritual. It was more of a religion. And it's been insane to see how my parents have gone from that to just sold out everything they got, do whatever it takes. If it means selling their house. So that's what they did like two years ago. Wow. They sold their house that. just to move closer to a church that they felt called to. My dad sold all three. And that's three. not the parents you grew up with. No. They, that, like they would have no. never done that. Yeah. No. He, he sold three of his pharmacies just to like, that's what he felt God was calling him to do. And so he could, and he's not normal retirement age. No, he's younger than 55. Like he still works as a pharmacist. He just sold. He's not the owner of it anymore. So these are all things that God positioned them to be in ministry. These are all things that God spoken to them. So I would say it's like, again, it was more religion than relationship. And so within a relationship, it's conversation. It's, you know, I get told something or some God asked me to do something and I step into that. Wow. And it was less that growing up. And now it's been a crazy transformation where it's like, they're so passionate for who Jesus is. Yep. And that's just resulting in them letting go of so many things. Yeah. And now it's insane that my dad is actually in ministry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what's he doing? He's over uh, life groups at a church in Columbus and Assemblies of God Church, amazing church called One Church in Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. And he oversees uh, groups there. And it's yeah. just crazy to see his journey um, of just being so passionate. Like, I, it's, yeah, like no matter where you are in life, some people think, oh, I, I've reached this age. I don't need to grow anymore. Yeah. But it's like God has called us all to grow and get closer to him so yeah. that other people can see the light that's in our eyes of Jesus yeah. Christ. And I've seen more growth in my parents spiritually in the last two years than I did in the first 20 years of my life. Yeah. And I think it's a great point. Uh, I just heard a uh, pastor talking about somebody that's uh, decades older than I am saying uh in a transparent moment for his own life, he said, the older I get, the more set in my ways I want to be, Right, you know? Uh, And he's explaining like, I, like I sit in the same spot on my couch. It's my spot. Yeah. I want this to eat. I want this to be my rhythm and my routine. I would like the older we get, the more set in our ways we tend to be. And what you're explaining is a, a spirit-led life, a God-led life, a relationship where God is constantly telling us areas we can grow and change. And it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that you, the older you get, the more set in your ways you get. Yeah, um, for and sure. And that's what your parents are living out, Yeah, that they could be 
comfortable doing what they're doing, but they're selling their house. They're positioning themselves financially so that they can serve in ministry. Yep. Like it's amazing. Inspiration. Your mom's serving in kids, yeah. uh, taking care of kids. I'm sure she does a lot more than that too, but I think that's awesome. So you, you grew up playing baseball. Let's talk about that. Uh, and, and then into the transition of uh, your journey of how you're not playing in the major leagues, but you're <laughs> in, in church. So yeah, totally but legit. You were talent. You're a talented baseball player. Yeah, so that was like my one passion growing up was baseball. I loved all sports, but baseball was, I felt the most comfortable in life when I w- was on the baseball diamond. Mm-hmm. And uh, so they call it the diamond. Huh? Yeah, the old Stas. diamond. Okay. Dude, we played softball together. You're pretty legit. Okay. <laughs> Not bad. I uh, I was playing softball. Here's a quick story. Uh, <laughs> you don't know this, but I was playing softball and I was swinging for the fences. Every uh, time. Well, for sure, every time. But I was swinging for the fences, and I'm pretty sure I threw out my shoulder, <laughs> and, and I and I missed the ball. Like I I swung and yeah. missed the ball strike. Uh, and I'm pretty sure I threw him threw out my shoulder. It hurt so bad that the next swing I pretty much was just swinging with just one arm oh, yeah. because I had nothing in my right shoulder, and uh, and just had a little dribbler and. They threw me out at first, and um, it hurt, like, for the next month. Oh, yeah. So that's my softball journey. It's a good journey. Yeah, I played baseball growing up, and uh, I loved it. And so for me, um, I knew going into college, my next step in life, I knew that was the one thing I wanted to do was to play baseball. And I did not want to play at a college called Mount Vernon Nazarene University in my hometown. So my two things were, like, I want to play baseball, but I don't want to go to that school. Yeah. And so I was looking at all these other schools, division two schools, um, and God just kept closing every single one of those doors and it was frustrating. And so then my dad being wise, he said, you just need to go try out and just go to Mount Vernon and see what they got. And I went there and ended up getting a scholarship to play. And it was a really good baseball program. So I just knew God was closing other doors. So I knew I needed to step into playing college baseball at Mount Vernon Nazarene where I ended up going. But two weeks later, I, and this is a big part of my story and big part of my journey is two weeks later, I was pitching in a game and I felt my, my arm was kind of hurting for the last couple of weeks. And it was the fourth inning of a game. It was a two to one game. And I threw a curve ball and I heard my arm pop. Oh. I heard it pop and I felt it pop and, and just shock. That stuff just makes me cringe. Oh. Shock went up my arm and I just was like pure panic. Like what just happened? Yeah. And I was like, do I throw another pitch? Like I didn't get the batter out. So I ended up just like throwing another pitch in a like just, just pain right into my elbow. So I took myself out for the first time in my life. I can't do this. Ended up getting an MRI a couple of weeks later and I, um, it's all, all ulnar collateral ligament. It's UCL of your, of your arm. It was ruptured in half. It was like a piece of paper in that pitch where it just like ripped in half. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's called the Tommy John surgery for any baseball fans. And so the only way that I could play baseball again, the game that I loved was if I had to get this surgery and it's almost like a year and a half recovery. So for me, it was a hard time because it's like the only reason I went to this college was to play baseball and then God tore that down or it just like, it just, I ended up getting an injury and um, God wanted me to walk through that season for a reason Yeah, um, because that is the story of how I got called into ministry, Yeah, which is insane. Yeah. So what happened next? You, you, have, you do the surgery. Yeah. Are you thinking you're going to go, you're going to try to play baseball again? Yeah. My hope is to play baseball, but it's not guaranteed. Like yeah. some people don't come back from it and it's like, I don't know what's next. And so I became extremely bitter that summer. It was the mm-hmm. summer after my senior year. And everyone else is like just living it up. Like, you know, the time, the summer before your college years, it's like having fun with your high school friends, your last like hoorah before going into college. And I'm stuck at my house for three months. I can't drive. And I have this giant like robotic arm. And I became very bitter for the first month. Mm. became extremely bitter. And I just felt like as I was sitting there, I'm like, what am I going to do? Just watch TV all day. And I, and I was just bitter at God. I thought God was the one that took this away from me. And I'm like, why, like, why did you call me to this school? And then the only reason I'm there, you know, is to play baseball. And then you took that away. At least that's what I thought. Yeah. And I felt like God whisper saying, and I know it's kind of a cliche saying, but he said so clearly you can either become bitter or you can become better. There's a reason why I'm walking you through yeah. this season. And so often it's like, that's what broken seasons are. 
broken seasons are just not just a means to an end. Broken seasons, God wants you to wants to show us something. Yeah. Like God wants to produce something in you. Like it's if you're walking through a broken season and that was a broken season for me, it's not just like gonna go void. Like God is producing something in you. Yeah. And so I was like, all right, you know, I felt convicted. I'm like, you're right. I, I surrendered everything. And I was like, I'm just gonna read God's word. If I'm gonna be stuck at my house for three months, I'm just gonna read God's word and I'm gonna memorize and I'm gonna just be sold out for Jesus. Yeah. And in the midst of that time, I went to a church camp. Um, church camp I've been going to for five years, a part of the youth ministry, um, that the Baptist church that I went to. And as I went to this, this, um, this conference, this little camp, I felt for the first time in my life, God had something massive for me. Hmm. And I don't know how to explain it. I just felt in my heart that God had something for me. So I'm walking into this thing with just expectation. You know, I'm yeah. ready. I'm ready for every moment. Like, what do you, what do you got, God? What, what is it? What is it? And each night and each day went by and it was nothing. And I would just remember, it was almost like I just kept getting disappointed. I kept getting dis disappointed. And then the last night, it was the last message. And I knew I was going to go home that night. I'm like, okay, here it is. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm, I'm getting ready. something. Yeah. I'm getting something here. Something God's about to show up in some crazy ways. Yeah. And the preacher preached his, his message and he closed and he walked off the stage and it was nothing. And I was like, man, I thought for sure God had something for me. Yeah. And right when I thought that the, the pastor went back on the stage and said, Normally I don't do this, but I feel like the Holy Spirit's moving. Somebody here needs to be called into full-time ministry. And in that moment, like, it was like, that was the biggest God moment of my life. And so really? again, my past, I'm thinking, and even in that moment, it's like the enemy's thoughts or just the different things going in through my mind is like, you're not good enough. This is not you. Like, who do you think you are? Like, you're an introvert that gets scared to speak in front of your social studies class. Like literally, I remember a memory in that moment was I, I was... <laughs> 15 students and I'm sharing a presentation and my knees were shaken. Oh, and he yeah. goes, who do you think you are? Like being called into ministry, like all these attacks right in that moment. And he went through and went to every section. He says, anyone in this section feel called into ministry. And I was the last section and my heart was beating faster than it's ever beat before. Like I was sweating, like as if I ran a half marathon, like I stood up yeah. and I don't remember standing up. Just, like yeah. I, it was like, it was like the whole time it was like, this isn't you, this isn't you, this isn't you. And God was like, I'm calling you, I'm calling you like to a higher level. This is you. I'm, I'm going to lift you up. Like even in the midst of, of hard times, I'm going to lift you up. And I stood up and I was like, and it was as if I stood up and it was as if like us, like an army of people that were like my, in the youth ministry surrounded me like immediately yeah. and like almost pushed me up front. It was as yeah. if God was like, I'm getting a hold of your life right now yeah. and I'm calling you to a higher level and yeah. I'm calling you Crazy. to ministry. And that was when I was 18 years old. And from 18 to 26, it's been a fight to stay. Wow. That's crazy, dude. I've never heard it quite like that, but that's an amazing uh, story of calling in the ministry. I think there's there's moments in people's lives uh, that are listening, not not necessarily the same moment of being called into ministry, but called into who they were created to be, where they they feel or sense those things. Like I believe God has created within us the capacity to hear from Him, yeah. no matter who you are. No matter what you believe about God, you were created with the capacity to hear from God in a moment like that. I think there's people that have those moments where it's like for some reason from the inside, yeah. they feel like maybe, maybe this is what I was created to do. And they feel inadequate. They feel insecure. They feel, uh, you know, have those memories of what they, uh, they weren't able to do. And, and I, so even, even knowing that what, what's the, what's the journey of calling mm. being afraid to stand in front of people to then uh, now now being a pastor. We'll, totally. keep, we'll keep moving it forward. Yeah. What happens after that? Yeah, and I think very, very often what happens is the very like place or the very spot in our lives that the enemy is trying to take us out is the very place that God wants to use for our greatest ministry. And so yeah. even leading up to that moment, that was the place that the enemy was trying to take me out is you're not good enough. He was knocking my self-worth and who I was. And so the journey after that, was honestly, it was three months of just like living on cloud nine. Like, I can't believe God called me like such a God moment, incredible. And then it, it followed six months of probably the hardest time of my life. Yeah. And I don't share this with a lot of people, but it was six months of like, not just like anxious thoughts, like 
severe anxiety. Yeah. Like two hours of sleep. Like I would be, I would have the most irrational fears of all time that I won't go into, but I would be about to go to bed and then it would be like these thoughts, Mm. all these thoughts. And I like, I just was the most unhealthy I've ever been. And it was like just crazy anxiety for six months leading up to that point. And, and I, and I felt like, well, what has changed in my life? The one thing that's changed is me being called into ministry. So I felt like it was like this anxiety added into just my life. I thought, well, if this is what ministry looks like, I, it wasn't even, I was you stepping can, into I ministry. Can't survive this. I can't yeah. survive this. Yeah. Like it's been six months after me saying yes yeah. to Jesus that I'm, I'm experiencing probably the lowest point in my life. Yeah. Wow. And it's like this anxiety where it's like an hour or two hours of sleep. Like I'm not even focused on myself. I'm not, well, I'm mm. not even focused on other people or even like the things in my life that I should be focused on because I'm just focused on, I just want to be healthy. Yeah. Like I just want to, I just want a night where it's eight hours of sleep. Like yeah. that's all. Yeah. And it just consumed me. Mm. And so for me, it was like, that was so hard and I had to fight with everything that I had. And I think so often it's like, you know, take heart because Jesus has already overcome the world. And that's what kept ringing in my ears as I was struggling through that, that Jesus has already overcome the world. I can take heart. Like he is the pioneer and the perfecter of my faith. He's already walked through this. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not walking through this alone. And I think it's like, we almost feel like our call or our life can be destroyed by the enemy, but the enemy can't destroy our lives. Like Jesus has already won the victory, but the enemy can distract our lives. And I think that was what it was. This anxiety was a distraction yeah. to what I was actually called to do. The, just the knocks on my self-worth, just the insecure thoughts were just, just a distraction of where God was calling me to. And so it was a journey and I had to fight with everything that I had. And truly speaking of amazing parents, it was my mom that I just couldn't take it anymore. And I, I kept burying it for six months. I buried it. Yeah. I didn't tell anyone these irrational thoughts. I didn't tell anyone that I was getting two hours of sleep a night. Mm. And I finally told my mom, I said, listen, mom, like, I can't take it anymore. Like, I need to tell you, like, what, what's been going through my mind. And I feel ashamed and I feel guilty constantly about it. And I feel like I'm not worth being in ministry because I said yes to Jesus. And now this is what I'm walking in. And I told it to her and she rebuked every one of those lies. Yeah. And so then now on, it was like a irrational fear came up and then my mom's voice yeah. trumped it. That's amazing. And said, this is faith. Yes. This is the enemy. This is not real. You're called to a higher. Yes. And so that's just the value of what actual our words impact other people. It's like, let's yeah. speak so much life over people that when those thoughts come in, it's like the voice of Kirk Graham or the voice of my mom or the voice of different people, which has been my experience, just trumps it. Yeah which is insane. Yo, that's awesome. And that's the, pr- that, like, that's the proof of God using people. Right. God, you, you know, it's not, God can speak to people, but he can speak to people through people as well. Yeah. And I, the same stuff. I've got my dad's voice in my head. I got my wife's voice in my head. I yep. got, uh, you know, uh, just, the, I had a similar story right when I stepped into ministry out of school. Uh, I was working at a church in Dallas, Texas, uh, an amazing church down there. And right after I accepted the position down there, I had, overwhelming anxiety mm. thinking I just made the wrong right. choice because my, sure. my choice was, uh, to, to step out of school, uh, not finish my degree to take this position. Um, and even though my, you know, my dad's very much pro education, he has his doctorate. Uh, he said, he said, I think the right thing for you is to take this job, yeah. go for it. So I like, I felt like I had the approval of the person that I look up to more than anybody on the planet. Yeah. And, and, I had this overwhelming anxiety and I called my dad right after I had signed the contract, if you will, to take this job. And it was like, I signed on the dotted line and I had instant panic. <laughs> I, I just made the, yeah. I made the wrong choice. I made sure. the, and I was, I, I, I was, I was like shaking. Like I, I, I have to go back in there and tell him I can't do it. I can't do it. I made the wrong choice. And I called my dad and he goes, he goes, no, you made the right choice. Yeah. You did the right thing. This is what you, that what you're experiencing is normal. You, you took a step of faith and now you've got fear creeping in. You made the right choice. So just relax. This, the, this feeling will, 
will stop. Yeah. And then I just had that, that voice in my head. It was kind of like growing up. I would always, I was a big time procrastinator and I had a lot of stress and anxiety with the schoolwork. I just school's not my strong suit. Mm-hmm. And I would panic like at like all these different moments. And my dad would just say something simple. Like he would just say, Hey, you just need more sleep. Yeah. Just get some sleep. You know, you'll feel better if you get some sleep. Right. And, and now actually that's the voice that comes in my head probably more often than anything else is, is, Hey, your, your, your engine's just a little low right. on gas, get a little bit of sleep. Yep. Just get a little, you know, that's what I think all the time when I feel like a little bit of fear, a little bit of stress, a little bit of anxiety it's my dad's voice of maybe I just need a little sleep, right. you know? And it's just funny how even just thinking that thought, I don't even get more sleep necessarily, but just thinking that thought of my dad's voice mm-hmm. is like, I'm going to be okay. Maybe I just need yeah, a little bit crazy. more sleep. It's going to be all right. You know, it's crazy. So, uh, that, uh, another part of that is I had some, I had some actually some real sleep issues and, and panic anxiety. Uh, and I remember going in that first position, going to the, the, the auditorium, the sanctuary, and I laid down in the dark. Nobody was in there. And I was just crying. And I called Kaylee. We were dating long distance at the time. And Kaylee, would she just read Bible verses on the phone for like an hour wow. while I was having trouble. I was having trouble breathing. Like it was a, it was the craziest physical experience that I was going through. I didn't even know why I was dealing with that level of anxiety. I couldn't breathe well. Wow. And Kaylee was just reading scriptures over the phone. Uh, I was down in Texas. She was in Minnesota. And uh, now that's that's a voice that's in my head of my wife reading the truth over me. And, yeah, and, yeah just confessions over me of who I am created right. to be. And that's the voice I have when I'm yeah. dealing with uh, anxiety, worry, all that. So, for sure. okay. So you, you work through that moment. Yeah. Uh, your mom helps you like in that moment. Uh, and then let's fast forward to you. Somehow you get a connection with a church that's starting up, uh, in Ohio and you start interning there and there's, there's some momentum in this right. calling. Yes. So go there. Great. So for me, when I got called into ministry, I, I was afraid because my experience of church wasn't like great. Yeah. Like youth ministry was great. Yeah. experience of like Sunday church was not great. So I'm like, I'm getting called into something that I don't even, even like really it. like. Yeah. yeah. And so I went to a church in Columbus and it was uh, called One Church. And it was the first church where I was like, man, this is fun. Yeah. Like I'm coming to, I can't wait for Sunday, like worship and just there's cool, like the pastor had tattoos and had like wore flat bill hats. I'm like, that's the first, you know, I'm used to like a six year old pastor Yeah. that was like, unrelatable. And now it's like, this guy's 30 tattoos, cool dude, like loves sports. And yeah. so that was the first time in my life where I'm like, my calling started to build momentum. Like, I yeah. think I could do this. Mm. Like, I think this is something that I could be a part of for yeah. the rest of my life. Yeah. And so, yeah, I was part of that church for three years. And some, the summer before my senior year of college, I was going to be the youth pastor there, but then God had just different plans. Yeah. And it's hilarious that it just happened through a woman. which is my wife Yeah, that she came to visit Ohio because her sister was one of the pastors on staff at one church. And she came to visit Ohio for like three weeks, no joke, three weeks. And we met on the first weekend she was there. And I knew like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it was like an epic experience where it was like, I saw her and I knew this is my wife, you know, it's like, you know, the the fairy tales and and the rom-coms of the world. But I would say I was 10 days in, after knowing her and I called my brother, Brian, and I was walking downtown Columbus walking towards a parking garage. Yeah. And I said, I met the woman I'm going to marry 10 days in, yes. which is insane. Epic. I don't know if it's me being overly optimistic and it ended up working out yeah, or I just felt something different. So I knew she was going to be the one. And so we met and we started dating three weeks later yeah. and now she's back in Minneapolis. Yeah. She went so to that's North where Central. she's living at the time. Yeah, I went yeah. to North Central University. So I'm like, okay. She started dating your long distance. Yeah, long distance. And so me being an arrogant guy, I think, oh, I'm about to graduate. She's for sure going to move to me. Like my whole family's in Ohio. Yeah. Like she's for sure going to move to me. And just through conversations. And her family's in Milwaukee. Yeah, Milwaukee area. And just kind of all around. Um, and through conversations with God, through the conversations with Emma, I knew that my next step was to move to Minneapolis, I just so knew, which is crazy. Yeah. yeah. So I never thought ever that I, I never even thought about Minnesota. I didn't think yep. I'd ever be here, but I, I felt- and you were loving the church that you were at. I loved so it. I loved that. I miss so, I miss them so much and yeah. they're doing amazing things. And my whole family's in, or most of my family's in Ohio. So for me, it was like, God got a hold of me again and was saying, 
I'm calling you to Minnesota. All I knew was like Emma yeah. and, and her brother, Caleb. That's, I knew two people and Ben yeah. Cruz actually. Yeah. Um, the, I knew three people that I was moving up to. It didn't, I didn't have a job. I didn't know what I was doing. I yep. just felt like this is my next step. Yeah. So I moved to, to Minnesota about three years ago. Yeah. And so, uh, you, you move, uh, and obviously your call in ministry serving at one church, you love that experience. You, I mean, and, uh, knowing some of the people there, like, obviously there's a lot of growth and development right. there. Uh, but now you're moving to Minneapolis and you got to find a place to land, uh, and talking with Emma, where are you going to go to church? So talk about how you came to River Valley. Um, yeah. and started serving. I mean, I wanted to work at a church, you know, I graduated yeah. with a biblical studies degree. Like I want to work at a church, but then I'm, I'm like, but I want you, I want to be where you want me to be God. Like, even if it doesn't mean you yeah. have a job. So I was praying about it for a long time. And then I felt as I was driving one day, I felt the Holy spirit speak very clearly and just said, River Valley, Minneapolis. Out of nowhere? Like, Out of nowhere. Did somebody tell you River Valley? Like you had I, knew, to I mean, know I knew about the River Valley. Okay, like yeah. I knew it was like Eagle Brook and Emmanuel yeah. and Substance and River Valley. Like all the bigger, great churches. All amazing churches yeah, yeah. and all like the bigger churches yeah. in Minnesota. And I just felt like it was just clear as day, River Valley, Minneapolis. And I'm like, okay. Like I knew I probably wasn't going to get a job. You guys were just launching the campus right when I moved up. And so yeah. I remember calling you. I don't know if you even remember this. I remember exactly oh, yeah, I where sure I, remember. I remember exactly where I was. There's certain like random moments in my life where I know exactly I was in the parking lot of my college and I'm calling you. And I just remember saying, Hey, I'm moving up in a couple of weeks. And I feel like God is telling me to be a part of your campus. Um, and I remember you're just like, Hey, we're going to reach the city of Minneapolis with or without you but we're going to do it better with you. So we'd love to have you. And I remember that just stuck with me, yeah, which is crazy. And so, yeah, so I moved up and I just felt like clearly it was uh, River Valley, Minneapolis. And I wanted to get a job, but I knew that was going to be the case. And so for me, it was a journey to figure out what that looked like yeah. to work in ministry, but also follow the call on my life. And so I moved up here and probably for a year and a half, I worked different odd jobs, Ruth Chris Steakhouse, Executive Aviation. Slinging steaks. Slinging steaks. If you haven't been, come on, you got to check it out. Um, and, and, <laughs> wow. <laughs> little sponsored, plug, little sponsored. Plug. <laughs> little plug for Ruth And just trying to figure out. That, that was a time where it was, again, like another shot on my calling because I yeah. thought, well, God, I thought you would open up doors quickly if you've called me to ministry and yet you keep closing doors. And so. It's just insane because of where you're at now. Oh, Anyways, yeah. yeah. And, and, and I just felt like God's like, will you follow me? Like, and I think so often it's like, God's not look, looking for intellect or he's not looking for like us having this, these epic gifts or talents. Yeah. He's just looking at people that are available and people that are just like, Hey, like I'm willing to follow you. Yeah. And so that's where I felt like I'm willing to follow you. And, and God takes us through those seasons of brokenness. And that was another very broken season that I didn't know anybody, that it was harder for me at the beginning to build relationships, to feel like I yeah. was at home. I mean, I was 12 hours from it yeah. and just trying to figure it out. And God produced so much in me. And so often he takes us through, at least in my experience, he takes us through broken seasons to crush those things in our lives that don't look like him. Mm. So all the pride in my life, all the insecurity in my life, all those negative thoughts in my life, yeah. all whatever that may look like, so many different things that I can give you a list and we could take the next hour doing it that God crushed down the yeah. things that did not look like him. He says in those moments of brokenness, Hey, will you just follow me? And when we're obedient and follow Jesus in those moments, he crushes those things in our lives that don't look like him so that the true anointing of God can fall on our lives. And the Holy spirit is not only in our lives, but he's on our lives yeah. for other people. Yeah. And so it's like, if I could have done it all over again, if I rewind three years prior, I would say, give me two years, give me two years of, of, of doing what I did odd jobs. Cause it would have produced even greater in me. Yeah. Um, and I wouldn't, that was the most potent, most beneficial season of my life of stepping into the yes, stepping into what God had for me. And even if it looked like I didn't know what I was doing or yeah. why am I here or why God, a lot of those questions, but I just stayed faithful. Yep. And in that God started produced so much in me. You started interning at River Valley. Yep. I remember a shift uh, in you for sure. Like there was a sense of early on, even before you were interning of, man, this this guy named Ben moved, <laughs> moved here. And I'm pretty sure he's met with more people than oh, I yeah. have in the last three weeks. Like you were setting up meetings with everybody, uh, getting like context and just hungry to be 
apart yeah. and to meet people and, uh, totally. which is awesome, but a shift from like grasping and like, like this striving of like trying to make your calling happen. you like, I think there's part of like following God and just being available. Like God, yes. I'm stepping into your calling, but there's also people where it's like, and this was you early on. My perspective was uh, a really like striving to make the calling happen. Uh, and then a yes. shift into God, don't let it happen. Don't open the door right. until I'm ready, you know? And for so sure. wh- when was that shift? What was that like for you? Yeah, I think it was just through our conversations, you know, mm. I was your intern and we had a lot of conversations and I grew up in a conservative church. So I, I believed in the Trinity. Like I, be- I believed in the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit, like for me was this mystic, weird, God-like thing. Like that's the only way I knew how to describe it. And so like, I just kind of, again, that's probably the only way most people know how to yeah, describe like, the Holy I just Spirit. Don't, yes. I just don't know. I, I couldn't, if someone said, what's the Holy Spirit? I'd say, well, he's God and he's part of the Trinity, but I don't really know other than that. And I never once prayed like dear Holy Spirit. I never had, I never had a relationship with the Holy Spirit for yeah. 23 years. Yeah. Like he, the Holy Spirit was living inside of me. Cause when you believe in Jesus, the Holy Spirit lives inside of me, but I, I didn't have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. I viewed the, the Holy Spirit as an it, yeah. not a him. I didn't view the Holy Spirit as a person I viewed or a God. I viewed it as just like this mystic it. Yeah. Um, And so that was the shift of, you know, I, again, I worked hard growing up. It was instilled in me. So I think like the gospel begins at the end of ourselves. And so like for me, I had, in my Evernote, I said I had 500 names that I wanted to get to know 500 people in this city in the first year or six months of me just, and that's just work ethic. That's just working hard. Yeah. But I think God, like in the call and anointing is, it goes past what we can do. Yeah. And that was where the shift happened in my life. It was yeah. like, and it happened, to be honest with you, like it just happened through the Holy Spirit Yeah, and getting baptized in the Holy Spirit. Like that's yeah. the only way to, to put it like, like, yeah. you know, it's more churchy language, but I got baptized in the Holy Spirit about a year and a half ago and my life has drastically changed because of it. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if you want to share a little bit of that story um, because I agree. I think, uh, and there's people listening that aren't even following Jesus, which yeah. is amazing. And right. we're honored that somebody would take their time to listen to these stories. Right. Uh, and and really one thing that we say in church all the time is you don't have to believe what we believe to yeah. belong. So if this, if some of this is faith based or whatever, um, it's okay that you wouldn't believe yeah. this or, or wouldn't have the same church tradition or whatever, but your experience of, uh, we, we believe, uh, we believe in the difference between, uh, the infilling and the indwelling. When you give yes. your life to Jesus, the, the Holy spirit now lives inside of you. That's the indwelling of the Holy spirit. He makes his home yeah. in you and he's a comforter and he can speak to you and guide you. And there's infinite things that the Holy spirit can do in you. Uh, but we also believe in the infilling or the baptism in the Holy spirit, uh, which is just comes greater power, greater boldness, uh, these gifts of the spirit. And there, there was, you know, for you, you had not been baptized in the Holy spirit, uh, in that sense, this infilling. And I remember that in you, I guess I'm kind of telling the story, but, um, there was a shift big time big time and you being the kid that couldn't speak and stand in front of a social studies class right to now you can i mean you're smooth as ice my man like it's <laughs> insane how good you are uh and it's crazy and i honestly believe you're probably the best example that i have on like in my whole life the best wow. example i have to give anybody of what it looks like to to who who you are before being baptized in the Holy Spirit, right. being spirit filled, and who you are after, yeah. like it it is that's what the you are an example of what the Holy Spirit can do. Wow. It's crazy, like crazy. So anybody listening, you can just get to know Ben and <laughs> like that example. Yes, let's get I, I remember that moment and. Yeah, your life's never been the same. And I think that that was almost, you, you've always been growing fast, I think, but it was almost like that was the, that was the spark in yes. this insane growth right. um, from that moment. So I don't know what year that was, if you remember, 2000, 2016, the beginning of 2016. Yeah. So really it's been a two year yeah. journey. Right. Let's talk about the last two years. Uh, you then started on staff at the church. Uh, part-time to full-time, but just, yeah. What, what's the last two years been, you got married. Yeah. We got married, um, about two years ago. I mean, and just journeying and finally figuring out what 
ministry actually looks like first time in ministry. So yeah. it's crazy that I like I got called when I was 18 and the first time that I stepped into a ministry role was when I was 24. And so six years later, and it's crazy just what God did in my heart in six years, but then yeah. the last two years, what God has been doing in my heart and what it looks like yeah. to be in ministry. And I think, it, again, it, going back to the, my relationship with the Holy Spirit, that's the thing that I think is the most evident in just the boldness that I have, just the power that is not by my might, not by my strength, but by the spirit of God that's yeah. dwelling in me and just that relationship and what that looks like. And I want to be so passionate about that relationship. You know, it's yeah. like, and it's not like an arrogant statement. And it's like, sometimes, honestly, I don't even know how to take it. Like, but in the last two years, I'm not kidding you, probably over 300 people or more have come up to me and said, man, you've grown so much. Like, I don't yeah. know if that's the thing now that people just like, they just, they just like, <laughs> they hear yeah. other people say it. So now yeah. they just want to say it because sure. it's like, they're just fitting in. Like, I, but I've heard that over, th and I, sometimes it's like, well, thanks. Like I must've been a loser back in the day. <laughs> that's how, you know, <laughs> it's like that, an insult. Yeah. Like, uh, all right. Like must've sucked, you know, like no, you no. really have grown, you know, like yeah. you were a loser. Like yeah. you're all right now. <laughs> no, um, but a lot of people see my growth, but a lot of people don't see my grit for the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Like for my passion for the Holy Spirit. So me like getting baptized in the Holy Spirit, I thought two things. I thought one, uh, this isn't real. This was back in the Bible. This isn't for today. Mm. And two, if it is real, it's not for me. And through messages, um, by pastor Rob, our lead pastor through just conversations with you, um, God tore down those lies. And that's when I entered into just a different relationship with the Holy Spirit and getting baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I remember getting baptized in the Holy Spirit. Afterwards, I drove to Free House. It was my day off. And it, and it wasn't- Free House is a restaurant. Oh, come on. Yeah, North Free House. Legend. So good. And I remember parking and I was getting breakfast by myself. Not an important meeting, nothing I needed anything for. And I, and I was um, walking and I never felt in my life more security more power, more boldness. And it was just simply through the Holy spirit. And so people see the growth that I've experienced, but simply like the only answer I have is the Holy spirit. And it's like, and I believe that's why God, that's why, and I haven't even really explained this to anybody else. And this might not make any sense, but I believe that's what God wants to do. Take yeah. the people that are broken, take the people that like, th that are just not even equipped at all. People that don't have any like public skills, like public speaking skills, take those people and do such a mighty work in their life that it's like they get to this spot where it's like so much improvement and so much growth that the only explanation, yes. that the only thing that makes sense is yeah. not something that they can produce. It's something that the Holy Spirit produced yeah. in them. And that's what, out of everything, that's where I want to live my life yeah. is I want to be the guy like where I'm walking in humility and I'm walking in the grace God has put on my life. But it's like, dude, the only explanation for your life is something that's past yourself and it's yeah. God. And that's where I, I want to live that life. Cause yes, hundred percent, like God has done something insane in my life and where I am now, I've grown so much in three years and I better grow more in the next three. That's yeah. how I, oh, yeah. you know what I'm saying? It's like oh, yeah. my passion and my tenacity towards the Holy Spirit and just like. And even the new position that you're stepping right. into. Yeah, there's new responsibilities, new influence, new leadership. Yeah, you got to grow. You're growing yeah. into that, right? which you will do, no doubt. So that's been my journey for the last two years in ministry is, yeah, there's a lot of new things that I'm learning, mm -hmm. but it's more so like just growing, yeah. just growing yeah. and continue to grow and and how do I grow? It's through my relationship with Jesus. It's through yeah. my relationship with, with, with the Holy spirit. And, uh, and also <laughs> my wife, my yeah. wife has helped that growth out a lot. Yeah. So praise yeah. God. Um, what are you dreaming about for the future of, uh, Minneapolis, but also your family, uh, just over the next couple of years, what, what's on your mind for, uh, kind of the just upcoming years? Totally. Yeah. For Minneapolis is just that, um, the Minneapolis campus would gain influence in every single corner in every single pocket of the city yeah. that there would be people in that city that know that God loves them so much that God is for them, that they're not in this alone. I know it's like, we have this epidemic of depression and anxiety and, and that's what I've walked through. So I have a heart for that, but not only that, but everything that people are walking through the shame, the guilt that they just know that there's a God that's for them. And yeah. so there's so many incredible churches out there that we're going to be partnering together. But for me and what I see in Minneapolis, I, I truly see like 
an outpouring of the spirit of God on the city of Minneapolis. Yeah. 100%. I, I have confidence in it. And I think the best days are ahead, not only for just River Valley Church and for Minneapolis campus, but the best days are ahead for the city of Minneapolis, that there's yeah. going to be people all around the city. And, and I think it's going to happen not only in the church, I think it's going to happen more so in the business world, yeah. in the high rises, yeah. that just the spirit outbreak that a revival is going to take yeah. place. And a revival is a word that's th- thrown around a lot, but that's what I pray a lot yeah. for. Yeah, you know, no doubt. Um, that it's something that we cannot produce. It's God pouring out his spirit. He's done it before. It's like God doesn't put things in the Bible just to tease us. Yeah. Hey, this happened in Acts. I'm just going to, I'm just going to like allow you to read it, but it's not going to happen today. Hey, don't believe for you it. Don't believe yeah. it for, no, it's like, no, like it no, can happen today. It, yeah. yeah. And totally. so at the end of my life, I want to get there and say, I did everything I could to believe for more. Yeah. And maybe God didn't do what I believed, but if we follow Jesus, yeah. we have our expectation and then we have yeah. the reality that we walk in. And many times the reality we walk in is far greater than what we expect. Oh yeah. And I, I do believe again, just what you said, the, the end of life, we will have lived some biblically epic stories. Oh yeah. You know, no doubt. The stories we read in the Bible, I agree, are possible today. Yes. You know, what we read about that happened thousands of years ago can still happen today because we serve the same God. For sure. And uh, it's not like God's heart is uh, less right. for the people that live on the planet today. No, no. no his heart's the same. Uh, and so I'm hoping to get to the end of the life, yes. uh, our life, and uh, hopefully we'll be friends for the rest of our lives. We will be. Yes. Uh, and we will have lived some biblically epic stories. Right. Uh, in just a second, you're going to hop on a plane and lead Global Team Sweden. Yes. Uh, so I'm going to let you go. But I got two questions before we uh, before we end. Uh, first question is, what's your favorite book of all time? Favorite book of yeah. all time? Oh, snap. Holes. <laughs> Great that was answer. A, that was That's my, a great that answer. That was my first book that I read. Yes. Holes when I was like in first or second grade. And I answer. love that book. Yes. I love the movie. I'm about to watch yes. it on the plane. Shia LaBeouf, man. Let's go. Dude. Holes, uh, it's not like an epic spiritual book. It's, no, but it's a uh, great story. But it was my first story. book, so I remember it. Yeah. So it's always whenever I see the Holes I book, love that I get answer. so pumped. I love that answer. It is one of my... Uh, I, I We read the book like my teacher read it to us, like, yeah. I don't know, middle school or something. Uh, and, uh, it's like, it's like one of my favorite stories. Like, Mm. yeah, no, that's awesome. Holes. Go get it today. You can buy it on Amazon. (laughs) We'll have an Amazon link for you. You can buy it. Uh, and, uh, the, the last question before we go and, uh, just again, thanks for being on this. And, uh, for those listening, my former position within River Valley church, it was the Minneapolis campus pastor and I couldn't be more happy and humbled that our leadership would see in you what I see in you, uh, that you are the right guy for the job. Um, you may feel like it's too fast, you know, or, you know, some of that, like, it's just too fast. I'm not ready, you know, but I, I love that. That's how God works. It's like God works for sure. God works either in our minds too slow or too fast. Rarely does he work like, yep, this is perfect timing. Mm-hmm. This is exactly what <laughs> I was thinking, Lord. Right. This is amazing. Yeah. Uh, it's either, it's like taking longer than we thought or it's way faster. And um, it's, it's, yeah, we're grateful. Like when it, when it happens, even though it took longer than we thought, like, I think it's like, well, God, your timing was perfect. Yeah. But when it's, when it's too fast, oh, yeah. it's almost like, the most thrilling. Yeah. It's just like, it's crazy. It just feels insane, you know, uh, that God could be that good, but also, you know, it's intimidating, but you're the right guy for the job and yeah, everybody loves you. So yeah, I'm just, I couldn't be happier and, uh, just proud to pass it on to, it's not really mine to pass on. It's really our lead pastor, pastor Robs. Uh, and so I'm just so grateful that he would take it from my hands and put it in your hands. And I think it's, I just think it's exciting. Uh, best days are yes. uh, uh, ahead for Minneapolis yep. for sure. Uh, last question. Anybody that's following you in your footsteps, maybe somebody that's dealt with anxiety, maybe somebody that feels unqualified, uh, just anybody that's, yeah, maybe feels a call to ministry. Uh, what's one piece of advice that you give them, just something to leave them with? Yeah, I think I've alluded to it a little bit, but just continue to follow Jesus in every single season through broken seasons, 
through blessed seasons, just continue to just be more passionate about Jesus than anything else. Yeah. And no matter what role you're in, whether it's in the church or whether it's in the business world, whatever role you're in, I think we're just called simply to follow Jesus and to be passionate about him and just to love on people. And so often we get so distracted by the other things. So my advice is stop being so distracted by the other things that will fade away, but be focused on the things that will last forever. And that's the kingdom of God and getting so many people in the kingdom of God as we can. And so for me, it's, it's less about the performance it's less about the platform, but it's more about people. Yeah. It's more about Jesus. And so, Hey, let's use our stories and our experiences and our good times and our bad times to be able to connect with people and love on people. But at the end of the day, it's about Jesus yeah. and it's about people. And sometimes that feels like it's a cliche answer and it's the easy answer, but that's what it's all about. And I'm going to hang my hat on those two things for the rest of my life. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, one, one thing that I know about you, uh, cause it comes up all the time when, when I talk to you in private is, uh, and this is how we're going to sign off. We're going to do some shout outs. When I talk to you in private, uh, you talk to me about, uh, just the love you have and the respect you have for each one of your brothers uniquely. Yes. So give a shout out to your four brothers on the way out. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to Steve, Dan, Brian, and Nick, the coolest four people I've ever met. Legends. Let's go. We love you. Thanks for being on yes. the, the show, man. You're the best. Yes. Love you, man. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you've enjoyed this, we'd love for you to subscribe to this channel. We've got new episodes releasing every single week. We'd also love to hear your questions or comments. You can uh, comment below. You can also find us on Instagram at Exception Podcast. And I want to give a quick shout out to our producer, Tissel. My name's Kirk Graham, and we'll see you back next week.